Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. Isaiah is going to bring the word of God to these people. That God says, I'm going to give them every other thing they want to their heart's content, that their desires are fulfilled because this is going to make them lethargic. This is going to make them so lazy in their pursuit of God. They're going to reach this point of contentment and of satisfaction, God says, to where they're not going to be interested in me. And we find that generically so, right? Folks that have everything in life seldom see a need for God inside of their life. It's a, it's a sense almost of judgment, if you will. So God says the heart of this people is going to remain fat. As a result, their ears are going to be heavy. Their eyes are going to shut. It's the idea of overindulgence at a dinner table. And you're just, you're just so full that you can't move. And all you want to do is go into a, a, a coma, <laughs> Of sorts, all right? We could probably testify to that before. Here's the, here's the perspective end result of that. So that they do not see with their eyes, and they will not hear with their ears, and so that they cannot understand with their heart. So God says, as the word comes to them, and as the word's fulfillment around them begins taking place, they're going to see, but they're not going to perceive. They're going to hear, but they're not going to have an attention to really receive what's being spoken. And their heart is not going to be able to comprehend the truth. Why? Because the very opposite of this is, is true, which is where we want to use our launching pad from tonight. If they could see, and if they could really hear, and if their heart really could understand or comprehend, then the Word of God would become effectual inside of their life and they would convert and they would be healed. So we see then in Isaiah 6 and verse number 10 the absolute necessity of comprehending the scriptures. The absolute necessity of understanding what the Bible has to say to us. Over the past several weeks we have seen several truths in relation to the holy scriptures. We have seen their sufficiency their efficiency and even their supremacy, not just in our lives, but, but in their totality over everything else, even over any other form of revelation. Remember, Peter said in reference to the transfiguration of Christ that when we have the Bible, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, more sure, more uh, accurate, more reliable than even some experience or revelation that we have seen with our eyes or have even heard verbally. We've learned through the past several weeks about both the desire and the effort that is demanded if we are to properly study these holy scriptures. In some of the most recent services, we have learned what is required to understand the scriptures by those who read them, that, that the scriptures have requirements placed upon them. If we are to come to them, I, I, I think about the scriptures uh, almost like I think about the Lord's Supper, that we are not to come unworthily before the table set before us, uh, literally with the Lord's Supper, figuratively when we come to the Word of God, as we feast on this manna from heaven, the Word of God, we are to do so in a worthy fashion. And remember, in, uh, I think it took us two messages to notice all the, all the requirements, starting with the fact that we must be a believer. The Scriptures were written for those who believe. Tonight we're going to come down to where we will begin looking at some very practical truths in connection with this study. And this is the source of every question proposed to me about reading the Bible, what we're going to deal with tonight. And I believe that if we could practically read the Bible for ourselves, then we would come to see all of these wonderful truths that we've been discussing for ourselves. If we can ever get to a place over whatever hurdles and obstacles that, that lay ahead of us in reading our Bibles, if we could just, just get over those hurdles 
and really read and understand the Bible effectively for ourselves, then, then you would begin to see in a, in a more particular fashion the sufficiency, the efficiency, the supremacy of the Scriptures come really alive inside of all of our lives. Over the next several weeks, I want to give us what I'm going to call the foundations to studying the Bible. And I'm going to ask us all to hold on pretty tight because the messages for the next several weeks are going to be a lot of kind of discussion forms rather than our typical teaching and preaching that takes place here on a regular basis. So you kind of bear with me as we work through these next several weeks. I think there'll be a source of immense benefit for us. So I believe it's going to be a huge help to anyone here uh, that has a desire to read and comprehend the scriptures. Anyone that finds himself repetitively questioning their own Bible study methods and wondering, am I doing this right? And maybe possibly I feel like I should be yielding more out of my everyday Bible reading. So here we go tonight. I want to give to you foundation number one this evening. Foundation number one is simply read the Bible. Read the Bible. Bible study actually begins with just doing that. With just simply reading your Bible. Someone, I was listening to Brother Mitchell preach the other day. I do that every week of my life. And uh, someone uh, said to Brother Mitchell, he said one time, said, I said, Brother Mitchell, I can't understand the Bible. And uh, Brother Mitchell, so quick-witted, uh, responded. He said, uh, he said, you couldn't understand any book that you don't read. <laughs> and uh, I thought how fitting that is to so many uh, inside of the professed church that we never even open the Bible and attempt to read it. The average churchgoer inside of America possibly may bring, you don't even have to do that anymore, but possibly may bring a Bible to church, uh, maybe Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, but very rarely is it cracked open Monday morning or Monday evening and the other days of the week. We must read the Bible. I believe every Christian desires to do this, But I also believe that a lot of those same Christians become very discouraged because they can never figure on a good Bible study method. And uh, and let's be honest, the Bible can be an overwhelming book whenever you begin to first start reading it. So without some good uh, method to employ in studying its parts, its words, even it as a whole, it could uh, really bring discouragement into our lives very easily. Other folks I've found read a lot of books about the Bible, but they never read the Bible itself. They read self-help books and they read books that cover topics of the Bible or they read commentaries based upon the Bible, but they steer away from the Bible itself. Uh, Some folks steer away from certain books of the Bible. Some folks won't read certain books because they, they think they're too hard or too complicated to get a good fixed grasp on them. A lot of folks read a lot of books, but a lot of folks also still never read the Bible for themselves. So I want tonight to start by showing us a good method for just working through the Scriptures on a regular basis. This is day in and day out material that I want to give to us tonight that I think would really help the majority of us here this evening. Every Christian ought to make it their personal goal to read the Bible every single day of their life. And I believe personally that you ought to read it more than once. I believe at bare minimum you ought to start out your day with the Bible and you ought to finish your day with the Bible. I believe you ought to meditate therein day and night. It wouldn't hurt, of course, to do that a little bit more periodically uh, throughout the day, but I believe and that is a great starting point for every believer, day and night. So let's, let's get involved then in learning how to do this on a regular basis. And we're going to start by looking at the Old Testament tonight, uh, reading through our Old Testament. And just saying that, probably creates a little bit of hostility for some of us because we know what is contained. Brother Brian's shaking his head back there. We know what is contained in certain portions of the Old Testament, like Leviticus. 
And isn't it such a joy to read through sometimes all of those ceremonial codes, the book of Numbers, and I know everybody takes their time to properly pronunciate every single name and the chronological list through the book of Numbers. Uh, all the codes, all the, all the historical backgrounds, all the kings, that, and you've got this king reigning and this king's reigning at the same time because you've got a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom and the overlap and, and they look like the, the same names and just a little bit of different spelling and all this kind of stuff. So there's a lot of hesitancy already on the board as we come to reading our Old Testament. But I believe tonight again that every believer should have as his goal of reading through the Old Testament at least once every year. I believe every believer should read through the Old Testament once every year. There are 39 books inside of our Old Testament. 929 chapters inside of the Old Testament. Therefore, to accomplish reading through the Old Testament in one year, you could take a few different approaches. Now, first of all, you could read three chapters on average a day. Three chapters on average a day would get you through the Old Testament in just under a year. Now, there's a little bit, what I would say, a, a problem with that that you may encounter where you may become overwhelmed and then sometimes it, it just, sometimes it's real difficult, maybe possibly, and then other times it's not challenging enough because some of those chapters are going to have 75, 80, sometimes 100, and, 100 plus verses uh, in them. So, uh, so if you get a few of those back to back, then you're going to be reading for maybe quite some time. And then you're going to come to the book of Psalms where you have uh, Psalm, uh, uh, Psalm 1, Psalm 2, and Psalm 3 that you could probably read those three chapters in probably less than five minutes. And so you're kind of out the door. That's one way to read through the Old Testament. Though, if you just divide it up three chapters on average a day, you could work through it in less than a year. Or you could choose to read on average about 20 minutes of your Old Testament a day. And uh, if you have an average reading speed, you would make it through in less than a year if you just devoted 20 minutes to reading through your Old Testament in one year. I, I personally do a, a little bit different of a method in reading my Old Testament. I make it a habit of mine to read one proverb every day correlating with the day of the week uh, that, I'm, uh, that, I, that we're actually living in. And also read about three Psalms on average or at least 30 verses out of the book of Psalms every day of my life. And so in my normal Bible reading, I don't, I don't cover proverbs and Psalms. And so on average, I read close to about two chapters at minimum every day from the Old Testament. And uh, so that allows me to work through the Old Testament at least one time throughout the year. So those are just a, a few examples for you to follow to get through your Old Testament in less than one year. And just think about the beauty of that. If you, if you do that, then you haven't necessarily scaled Mount Everest in the first year. But if you're like me, I've been saved for 19 years. And that, that, that means if I started that as soon as I got saved, then I would have at least read through my Old Testament 19 times by the time I am 34 years old. So, uh, so understand that in reading and comprehending the Bible, we're not looking for a sprint. We're looking more of a marathon. We're looking more the longevity of this thing. Nobody expects you to become a scholar overnight. And if you have the idea you're going to become a scholar overnight, you're going to meet up with a whole different kind of uh, discouraging monster inside of your life. The Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew with a little Aramaic sprinkled inside of it. Hebrew is relatively a very simple language. I say that I do not speak Hebrew, uh, so uh, English is difficult enough for me. But when you compare it to the Greek New Testament, Hebrew is a whole lot more simpler than uh, the Greek language. It doesn't have all of the different concepts associated with it like the Greek language of the New Testament. So as you read through the Old Testament, you're going to notice that it's mostly a narrative with principles and prophecies kind of intermingled throughout its pages. So a lot of narrative, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, 
uh, Joshua, Judges, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, uh, all of those books, Ruth and 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, and Esther and Nehemiah, all of those books are going to be historical books, the book of Job, uh, all, all historical accounts, working through narratives, seeing principles, seeing, seeing precepts to apply, uh, seeing prophecies starting as early as Genesis 3 and verse number 15 and building as far as messianic prophecies are concerned. So, uh, so there's a, a lot of content spread out over 929 chapters. I think a good habit to get into while reading through any book of the Bible is to make some kind of mark in the passages that you don't quite understand. And this may seem a little bit overwhelming, so again, I would just caution you not to anticipate knowing every definition of every single word uh, throughout your Bible. But as you read through, just maybe make a mark in your margin or have a notebook handy and, and just write down book, chapter, and verse, you know, a question mark or a, or a word or phrase, an expression or a seeming custom of that day that doesn't make sense to you. Just kind of keep track of it. And then what you can do is when you have some spare time one day, uh, you can come back through and do some research, get a, a Bible dictionary or something like that and look up some words and do some research and find out its meaning. And then the next time when you come reading back through, you're not going to have to mark that particular passage because you've already grasped hold of what it's talking about. And every year then, if you employ this method, you're going to read through your Old Testament at least one time. And it's probably not going to seem right off the bat to be making a lot of, uh, you're not going to be seeming to make a lot of ground with, uh, with just reading through it. 365 days pass and you've read 929 chapters, you've made it through your Old Testament one time. But again, it's not the idea of a sprint, that of a marathon. Before long, you're going to have read through your Old Testament five times. And 10 times, 15 times, and, and, and what you're going to notice is each time you read through your Old Testament, you're going to have a better handle for it, a better, a better grip on everything that's transpiring uh, through the narrative of the Old Testament and then the prophetical sections. Now, what about the New Testament then? How do I make a proper study of the New Testament scriptures? Well, to start with, I would say tonight that I believe that our plan of reading the, the Bible ought to focus primarily uh, on the New Testament. I think, uh, I think we ought to give a lot more attention and a lot more focus to reading the New Testament. Let me read to you just a couple of passages from the Apostle Paul, first of all, writing to the church at Colossae, Colossians chapter 1, verses 25 and verse number 26. Paul says, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you. To fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Then Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 through verse number 5, Paul says, How that by revelation he, that is Christ, made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which he says in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. In both of these passages, what Paul says to the church at Colossae and the church at Ephesus is simply this. God has now given us the culmination of revelation. He has given to us the mystery that has been hid in past ages. God has now revealed this to us. So when you look at it, what Paul's saying to the church at Colossae and the church at Ephesus is the 39 books of the Old Testament were preliminary to the unfolding drama of redemption that is finally and ultimately revealed for us in the New Testament scriptures. What started out in Genesis 3.15 comes to pass in Matthew 1 through ver, uh, chapter number 28. The drama of redemption, the proto and the first promise of redemption finds itself coming to fruition with Jesus, Emmanuel, being born, God himself wrapping himself in a body of flesh, living a sin-free life, no fault found in him. He was... He was uh, made to be sin, who knew no sin. He died on an old rugged cross, was buried, paying sin's price, alleviating the curse of sin to all of those who would believe, was buried, and 72 hours later, at a, at a maximum point, he was raised from the dead and now lives evermore to make intercession for us. You see that? There he is, the unfolding of the mystery of the redemption that we have uh, 4,000 years of Old Testament history 
lived in anticipation of this great unfolding of redemption's plan. Both of these passages, inside of both of these passages, we find that the emphasis of Paul's ministry was in revealing that New Testament, revealing this new covenant that God was going to establish not only with the nation of Israel in a futuristic sense, but with this mysterial, uh, mysterious body, the church, that has now been established in this parenthetical age. And Paul would periodically throughout his writings allude to the Old Testament several, several times. Paul would allude to the Old Testament, but he would allude to it as it provided illustration and support for this New Testament revelation. It's no surprise to anyone here tonight, if you've been reading the Bible for any length of time, uh, that, uh, that sometimes we muster through the Old Testament because, again, it's just a lot of information, a lot of, a lot of principles, a lot of admonitions, a lot of narrative, uh, and, and we almost breathe a sigh of relief. And I, I, think, I think we don't talk about this a whole lot because it makes us feel kind of unspiritual because we're supposed to appreciate the whole Word of God, and you, and you should, and we do appreciate the whole Word of God. But there's a reason why we breathe that sigh of relief as we go from Malachi into Matthew. That's because we see the, really the, uh, the validity and we, and we see, the, uh, I, I guess, the appropriateness of what's being written on New Testament soil for the child of God. It's so relevant to us because it's going to speak to us as far as our behavior present tense. We're no longer reading about sacrifices and bringing a lamb or a a pigeon or a turtle dove. We're no longer reading about a day of atonement or or, or feast days or anything like that. But we're reading about walking in the light as he is in the light and and, and, and attending uh, to church to to hear the Bible read, to hear the Bible uh, exegeted in, in our presence to have it discussed and have it laid open the doctrines of the new testament unfolded for us the new testament then is the culmination or the climax climax sorry uh, is the culmination or the climax of revelation it is the place where god desired to bring his children and did bring his children inside of our new testaments reading through the new testament then should be given more time but it's also going to have to be given more effort and that will make uh, uh, good sense to us as you begin pouring over the New Testament scriptures. The New Testament was written originally in the Greek language, and for that, for us, that means it is a more complex language. Uh, it has uh, statements and expressions in it that are uh, don't necessarily translate very well over into the English language. So you'll read some things, and it'll make you kind of scratch your head a little bit. I think tonight. Uh, what I would give to us as far as a good method of reading through the New Testament is to make an, a, a probably uh, an adaptation to how we're reading through it. And I think this would be, a, again, an immense benefit for us. Reading through the New Testament, developing a method for it is going to require a little thought and a little ingenuity on our part. So what I want to do here is just kind of give you some examples for you to enlarge upon and build upon in your own daily reading of the New Testament. So uh, let's start by taking a look at the book of 1 John, just by way of example. You don't have to turn there uh, tonight, but uh, let's say that, that you want to start reading through your New Testament tonight, and you decide that you're going to start in the book of 1 John, which, by the way, I think is a tremendous book of the Bible to start with. So if you were to select the epistle of 1 John to start reading with or reading through, you would first find out that it has five chapters and this is the method that I would propose to you in tackling the book of 1 John then. I would encourage you to read all five chapters in one day and to repeat that process for seven days straight. And so what you're going to do for the first week of reading through the New Testament is you're going to read 1 John chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 every single day for seven days straight. And at the end of that week, what you're going to discover is that you have a deeper appreciation for the book of 1 John than you would have had if you had only read casually through it one time and then moved on to the next book. What this is going to allow you to do is read those chapters and then while they're fresh on your mind, come back into them the next day and read through them again. And, and what that's going to do for you is it's going to let you start picking up very quickly on the things that you're reading that you really have no idea what you're reading. Because now you're not reading just to get through it and say, I've done this. You're reading it to gain a comprehension of what it's actually saying. So 
You take the book of 1 John, you read five chapters a day for seven days straight, and by the end of the first week, you've read through this book of the Bible already seven different times. It'd also be a good practice, and this may, uh, this may intimidate some of you, but uh, it wouldn't take a lot of effort here, uh, to take a note card, maybe just a little three by five card, and to write down the major concepts that you see inside of each chapter as you, as you read through it, just have a little three by five card, and as you read through maybe the second or third time uh, through those chapters, uh, those individual chapters, just you're starting to pick up on a pattern and just write down it. There's no test, no quiz, no Bible Institute here. You just uh, kind of what you get out of the chapter, just write down a major concept. This will uh, help you retain some of that information as you move into the future. So after First John, maybe uh, move to a larger book of the Bible. I think probably what I'd recommend to you after you read 1 John is maybe going over to the Gospel according to John. And the first thing that you're going to notice as you come to the Gospel according to John, the fourth book inside of the New Testament, is that it is much larger than 1 John was. This is the long sermon, if you will, of the Apostle John. You're going to notice that it has 21 chapters and so some of you are thinking, preacher is fixing to tell me to read 21 chapters every day for seven days straight. And you're absolutely right. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not telling you to do that. That's wonderful if you could do that, but I'm not necessarily going to recommend you to do that because you'll probably quit day number one, most of you. All right, so you come to the Gospel according to John. It's got 21 chapters. What do you do? Well, here's where the ingenuity, a little fault comes in. Uh, what I'd recommend is take and divide John up equally. And so uh, one way that you could do that, in my mind, is just take uh, 21 chapters and divide them into three sections, seven chapters each. And so take, uh, take the first seven chapters and read seven chapters a day for seven days. And do the same thing like you did in 1 John. Have a three by five card there and write down the major concept associated with each of those first seven chapters. And then, uh, and then after that week, the second week, take chapters uh, 8 through chapter number 14 and read through, the, through those every day for seven days. And so the idea is maybe start on Sunday and read through Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, each time going through it just like that. And then the third week, take chapters 15 through chapter 21, and you will have completed through the book of John, the gospel according to John. In three weeks' time, you will be able to say, I have read the gospel according to John seven times. So in four weeks... You've read 1 John seven times, and you've read the gospel according to John seven times. Now, I know what most of you are thinking probably right now. The question that we would all be prone to ask ourselves is, Preacher, how long is it going to take me to read through my New Testament at this rate? Well, before I answer that question for you tonight, what I would start to say is that we have a wrong tendency to pursue quantity over quality. And that is a huge mistake when you come to read the Bible. We have a tendency to pursue stats more than talent. We want, we want the points on the board. That's really ultimately what we care about. But here is the beauty of the method that I'm proposing to you in studying and reading through your New Testament. Uh, following this methodology is going to allow you to read through your entire New Testament in roughly 42 weeks. Those of you that are trying to come up with the math there, that is 10 weeks less than a year. So you still finish in under a year's time. But remember, as you're employing this method, reading through your New Testament, you're not just reading through your New Testament uh, by the time you get to that 42-week mark. You haven't just read through the New Testament one time, but you've actually read through your New Testament seven times by the time you get to the 42-week mark. Here's, here's what I like about this. So uh, instead of me reading Matthew chapter number one today, and then next year this time, 365 days later, I come back to Matthew chapter number one to read it again, and by that time I've forgotten everything that it ever said, and I'm reading it like it's, uh, like it's brand new for the first time. You ever, you ever hear folks say that? I've said that so many times, you know, sometimes I open the Bible and I read it, and it's like I've never seen it before. It's because it's been over a year probably since I've seen it before, and it does seem new to us. You know, if you only saw your spouse, I don't know if that's a good illustration or not, but if you only saw your spouse every year, they would at least seem new to you, different. 
maybe more pleasant. I don't know. I don't want to get into all of that with you tonight. So uh, again, if you do this, by the time you get to 42 weeks, you've read through your New Testament seven times in a row. And you're also, keep in mind, you're also making notes on the major concepts associated with each chapter. Now, what do we hope to accomplish by reading the Bible like this? Now remember, you're reading the Old Testament 20 minutes a day, and you're reading the New Testament, which is probably if you're reading it on this fashion uh, after this method, you're probably going to, it's going to take you somewhere around 30 to 40 minutes. So what you've got is an hour devoted in your day to reading the scriptures, horror of horrors, right? Maybe you wake up in the morning time and you read through uh, your Old Testament for 20 minutes, and maybe lunchtime and maybe evening time you spend uh, your time with your New Testament. I, I don't know how you want to break it up, but I know this, the goal of reading our Bible like this is comprehension. It is comprehension. Remember, the Bible is not a magical book. It, it's not a it's not a, where you take your Bible and you slip it underneath your pillow at night and because you got so close to it uh, that, that you, it's just magically going to pop into your head. Have you ever had someone ask you the question, the fearful, dreaded question, uh, what did you read in your Bible this morning? <laughs> or maybe they ask you something even more dreadful than that, what did you read in your Bible yesterday? And they're not looking for book or chapter or verse. That's what my children do. They said, oh, I read uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 3, Daddy. I, I don't care the reference. Tell me something about what you read material-wise. And then you see the sweat beat up and they act like they had to use the restroom. You know, we're, we're about the same way. You know, if I was to put you on the spot right now, I'd say, what'd you read in your Bible this morning? Some of you know it always would just act like you knew what you're talking about and just pull out like John 3, 16, the love of God. Uh, but but this is, this is kind of normal for folks because we're not retaining what we're reading because we're not comprehending what we're reading. We have difficulty answering because we're not retaining a vast amount of what we're reading on a regular basis. Again, the Bible is no book of magical spells. If we don't understand what it's saying, it's not going to be of any value or any benefit to us. I can't stress that enough because I was raised in a church that told that you just read it and it doesn't matter if you ever understand anything in it. You just read it and it's, and it's going to perform its function inside of your life. Find me that verse in the Bible. All right, It doesn't work like that. and that, that's, that's why we have the results that we have of people that just skim through their Bible, they read through it as fast as they can, and they jump up and they hurry out the door, or they, or they, they, they read it, you know, and all these, and, and I'm for reading the Bible, and I'm for cramming it in anywhere you can, but there has to be a time, and there has to be a method where you sit down and you employ yourself to finally comprehend what the Bible has to say. And this circumvents is just a, a completely different message. Just circumvents, uh, circumvents the idea that we become children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. You know who does that? People that never have a good comprehension of what the scriptures have to say. That's why people can leave a, a, a one church and go to a completely different doctrinally based church and fit right in and see no problems because nobody understands what the Bible's saying in the first place. There's no magic to the Bible. If you don't understand it, it's going to be of little benefit to us, but if we can grasp what the scriptures are saying, then we can hope for a steady conversion throughout the course of our lives. Remember what God said to Isaiah. This people are going to become content. Their ears, their hearts are going to become heavy. Their eyes are going to become dim. They're going to see but not perceive. They're going to hear but they're not really going to listen. And their heart's not going to understand. It's not going to comprehend. And because they can't get it, because they don't understand what the Word of God is really saying and how it's applied, they will not be changed. So our hope tonight is that we do come to learn to comprehend the Scriptures. And that's the source of our continual conversion throughout the rest of our Christian experience in this life. Let's stand tonight for prayer.